equations, you know, where the right-hand side is zero and the, the expression in parentheses there is zero. So, the, so the, uh, the, the acceleration through that point has to be chosen, you know, very delicately by L'Hopital's rule because it's zero over zero. So there was a lot of skepticism that the sun would, would pick such a solution. Uh, but it does. And that turns out to actually be the only real stable solution of the problem. All the other solutions are, are unstable for outflow. And he only had to wait a few years for the, uh, for the dawn of the space age to catch up. You know, Mariner 2 left the, uh, the Earth's magnetosphere and directly confirmed the existence of this supersonic solar wind. And since we know that, this, that the solar wind, if I can go back, is, is subsonic near the sun, you know, these hydrostatic scale heights seem to work out pretty good close to the sun. And if it's supersonic far away, the only solution that bridges those two is Parker's uh, critical solution. Uh, the spacecraft also discovered that there's almost a sort of a bi-stable solution, a bi bimodal distribution of solar wind speeds. The, uh, the, 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 the sonic point is, occurs at a speed of you know, 100, 150 or so kilometers per second, but it keeps on accelerating. Sometimes accelerates just a little bit in high density flows. It's a slow speed uh, component of the solar wind. There's also a sort of a super accelerated, low density component. Uh, the, the product of the speed and the density is roughly constant between the two. So the same amount of mass is coming out of those two different regions. And you can, you can delineate all sorts of differences in the, in the plasma properties that spacecraft can measure. I won't go through all of them. Um, but for a while, people didn't really know which type was, the, was sort of the ambient background time steady solar wind and which one was the perturbation. Because for a while, all of the spacecraft that were measuring the solar wind were staying within the ecliptic plane. So they tended to see this, this slow, dense component a lot and only see the fast uh, solar wind uh, that, that we now know comes from these unipolar coronal holes uh, much more infrequently. Now, when the, in, in the 1990s, the Ulysses spacecraft went out of the plane of the ecliptic and measured you know, huge volumes where the, where the fast solar wind is the only thing that you can see for, 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 for miles around, uh, we knew that was, that, that's the sort of the more basic time steady state of the solar wind. And there's been other probes. The, the Helios probes went into about the orbit of Mercury. The Voyagers, as, as you've seen in a lot of press uh, releases, has now gone past the termination shock, out past 120 astronomical units. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, telescope remote sensing. The, the, there's, uh, I worked for years on a team of the ultraviolet coronagraph spectrometer mission on the SOHO satellite. And we discovered in, in the fast solar wind, in the low density fast solar wind regions, we discovered that the temperatures of the different particle species started to diverge from one another. Because the densities were so low, the, the, the collisions between the different species became very infrequent. So it became a collisionless plasma with kinetic effects, departures from Maxwellian distributions, and, and things like that. So, so, so we've learned a lot about the, 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 the context and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the plasma properties of the solar wind. Here's another illustration of the actual outflow of the solar wind. This is a white light coronagraph uh, a series of images taken, I think, one image every 20 minutes or so over the scope of a day, and then it repeats. The actual size of the sun is, is, delimit is, is shown by the, by the white circle. There's a, there's a slightly uh, bigger uh, occulting disk that's placed in the, in the, line, in the, in the telescope to, to block out that bright light. And the other emission out here has been processed with wavelets so that you can see much more clearly the frame-to-frame the, the, the -to -frame variations. And if you just sort of look back and you know, uh, uh, fuzz your eyes a bit, you can basically see outflow pretty much everywhere. Uh, your eye gets drawn to these coronal mass ejections, which are violent sort of reorganizations of the, coronal, of, of the magnetic field. But everywhere else, there's outflow too. There are some places where there's inflow. Right over the North Pole there, you see some, some flow coming down. Um, but overall, you can see the solar wind happening pretty much everywhere. Yep. That's right. L leaves in the wind. I think that's right, yes. Well, if, if we see these, these sort of 10% level intensity fluctuations advecting out with the solar wind, we're at least seeing the fact that they're, they're, they're flowing out, well, either with the wind or if they're wave-like, they might be flowing out faster or slower, depending on the phase speed of the waves. That's true. <laughs> 
There's papers been issues. there's been a, only a surprisingly for such an interesting data set. There's only been a small number of papers where they've done sort of image to image correlations to try to track the velocity of the features. Usually they can do it best in the bright streamers, um, and they see typical 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 slow solar wind speeds in the corona of 100 to 200 kilometers per second. Similar than similar to what uh, uh, Russ Howard and Neil Shealy did with the uh, with the with the blobs coming from the tips of the streamers. So, so the assumption that, that we're just seeing the leaves on the wind here, at least in the, in the bright streamers, it, it seems to agree with what the models say. But yes, no, it is an important caveat that we're seeing the, uh, that, 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 that we're seeing you know, very small perturbations amplified by this wavelet technique. OK, if I can shift gears just a little bit. Uh, there's also been a whole bunch of different measurements of, of the mass loss rates of different stars across the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Remember from Astronomy 101, right? We've got luminosity going up, temperature increasing from right to left for weird historical reasons. The so-called main sequence of, of, of stars is the gray band there. And uh, I've plotted in white the evolutionary tracks for stars that once they're born on the main sequence, they, evolve, tend, they tend to evolve either to the right or up off of the main sequence to cooler and, uh, and larger radii, you know, from dwarf stars to giants and supergiants up in the upper right. And the colors of the points show measured mass loss rates of different winds. Um, the sun is down here with a relatively puny mass loss rate of something like 2 times 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year, similar to what uh, uh, Jeff Linsky and Brian Wood inferred from other nearby stars from their, from their Lyman Alpha emission. And a lot of the brightest, uh, 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 highest mass loss points come from these P-Signy profiles and other diagnostics that I talked about before. Now, when you look at this, the, the, the main thing that you can see is that there does seem to be a luminosity dependence to the mass loss rate. So when the star is generating more energy, it's losing more of its kinetic energy in mass loss. And for the brightest stars, brighter than about maybe 1,000 solar radii, you know, massive stars on the upper main sequence, and cool, luminous supergiant stars on the upper right there, uh, we believe that the radiation, that that high luminosity really does have something to do with it. You know, more luminosity means more photons, more radiation pressure, and in, a, in, in either an ionized gas with plenty of spectral lines or a gas that forms dust, uh, the, the radiation can interact with the opacity of, the, of, that, of either the ions or the dust and transfer that energy and accelerate away the flow. So the more photons, the more outflow. And it's very clearly correlated with the, uh, the luminosity. But for the big stars and for the red giants just sort of ascending off the, off the main sequence, uh, they don't seem to have enough photon luminosity to do that. Um, so we've been, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about extending models of the solar wind, mainly driven by MHD turbulence and driving hot coronas, uh, and extending those models to these other stars. And I'll, I'll come back to some of those, uh, some of those results later. OK, second part of the talk, a little bit more about the physics, uh, mainly focusing on the sun. Yep. Yeah. Really, they're, they're, they're really hard to measure. Um, they don't have these uh, P-Signy profiles. Um, they have flares. There's tons of flares coming from them. Um, but there really aren't good mass loss measurements. Uh, there was one paper recently. Uh, by a guy at Goddard who looked at M dwarfs in close orbits with white dwarfs. And if, 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 if the M dwarf wind deposits material on the white dwarf, you can measure the abundances of material on the white dwarf and try to back out what it should have been. But it's, it's very, very iffy. But yeah, huge growth area if somebody could find the right diagnostics for mass loss. OK, so the physics between wind acceleration and coronal heating. OK, so going back to Parker's idea, right? He had the basic idea that a higher temperature corona would accelerate a faster wind. And this is just a figure from his paper, right? Velocity versus height above the surface for a half a million degree corona, 1 million, 1 1.5, and on. You know, higher temperature means more gas pressure, means faster wind. So do our observations where we can actually measure these temperatures in the coronal source regions of the wind, do they back this up? A preliminary, a preliminary answer seems to be possibly no. Uh, Shadia Habal uh, published a paper based on the red and green lines measured during, uh, during an eclipse. 
And by measuring these different uh, high ionization states of iron, you can back out what the electron temperature should have been to produce those ionization states. And it turns out that the coronal holes have lower electron temperature than the, uh, the streamer regions that give rise to the slower wind. So faster wind comes from lower electron temperature regions. And that's also backed up when you look at the ion charge states measured in the solar wind, too. Uh, so it's clear that the fast wind needs something besides this gas pressure that's correlated with temperature to, to accelerate it so fast. So that's another sort of monkey wrench in the system. Yeah? Sure. That's right. The, the, the That's right. The, in, in, in these coronal hole regions, the, the heavy ions are, are much, much hotter, but they're very low in number density. The, the protons are mildly hotter than the electrons in the coronal holes, maybe only a factor of two or so hotter than the electrons. Um, so, 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 so the total gas pressure, uh, if anything, it, it might be a wash between the, between the fast and the slow speed regions. But, but the electrons certainly could contribute at least half of the, of the total pressure. Um, but, but, but there's certainly not a, a, an excess of gas pressure in the, in the coronal holes. OK. Uh, so, the, so, so where it all comes from is believed to be the, the, the convection zone beneath the solar surface. You know, it's convectively unstable for a, for, for a solar type star. There's rising and falling blobs uh, uh, in, in thermodynamic uh, convection. And, and, and most people seem to agree that there's more than enough mechanical energy in those convective overturning motions in order to heat the corona. In fact, all you need to do is just take about 1% of that and translate it, you know, tr transfer it up to the corona and translate it into heat in order to produce the, the, the million degree corona. But the question is, how does that happen? You know, how, is it trans how is that energy transported up above the solar surface into the corona? How is the energy converted from kinetic energy into magnetic energy because the corona is very magnetically dominated? How is it dissipated as heat? And or how is that, how is some of that energy go into additional wind acceleration, for example, in those, in those fast solar wind regions? This is just a, a, a 3D simulation from Mats Carlson that, that attempts to, to, to follow these convective motions and to look at how it jostles the magnetic field. So, there's all, there, so, so because of, of disagreement on, on the details here, there's been a whole bunch of different, uh, uh, I've got four different versus uh, ideas here of, of uh, controversies in coronal heating theory. You know, I'll, I'll talk in the next slide about waves versus reconnection, the so-called AC versus DC coronal heating ideas. Uh, is the heating actually deposited in the corona and it conducts back down, or does it convect, advect its way up from the chromosphere, as, as has been seen in some measurements of, of spicules? Um, the open field, the open magnetic field that feeds the solar wind, is that primarily just jostled back and forth by the convection? Or is there magnetic reconnection that takes this dominant closed magnetic field and injects some of the energy into the open magnetic field? More, more controversies that we still don't have uh, uh, good, good conclusions on. But this time scale one is important for heating the low corona. Whoops, I didn't get there yet, but I just wanted to show an alternate uh, couple of cartoons and, and images to, to sort of back up the general idea, right? You've got this convection. This is a, this is a white light movie of, of a small fraction of the solar surface. So we're looking at the upper edge of the convection zone in the photosphere. The solar photosphere is an interesting uh, boundary in the plasma parameters because the so-called plasma beta, the, the ratio of gas pressure to magnetic pressure, undergoes a very rapid change in the photosphere. It, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the beta is greater than one below the photosphere, which means gas pressure dominates and magnetic pressure dominates above the, uh, above the, the, uh, the photosphere. And so, so the photosphere is a natural boundary. The, the, the magnetic field uh, uh, has, a, has sort of a salt and pepper appearance. There's positive and negative polarity structures. Depending on the, the, the local balance between the positive and negative polarities, tells you whether the field is primarily closed, if it's balanced, or, or if there's large open regions where it's unbalanced, you know, where there's much more of one polarity than the other. And these cartoons are various ways of trying to visualize how the open and the closed magnetic fields uh, uh, interact with one another in the presence of this convective jostling. So the convective jostling has a specific time scale to it. 
And as you look above the solar surface, you can compare that time scale to the time it would take a, an alphane wave, you know, a, a perturbation in the magnetic field, to propagate along that magnetic field. So there's been sort of two uh, schools of thought on coronal heating theory, depending on how those time scales compare with one another. So if you have slow foot point motions from the convection, where that, where that uh, convective time scale is long compared to the time it takes the alphane waves to, to propagate along a magnetic structure, then that means that, that, uh, uh, that, that, that in between the times of the, of the slow foot point motions, the, the, the coronal magnetic field has time to sort of quasi-statically uh, evolve itself essentially into a series of static uh, equilibrium states. And, but because the, 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 the ends, and this is, this is the stretched out version of a coronal loop where both ends are being jostled, um, because, uh, the, because they're being twisted and braided and, and the, the fields are becoming ever more complex, uh, parallel currents build up in such a system and eventually get impulsively released by magnetic reconnection. So the, 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 the ideas are called DC ideas because of the slow foot point motions. The opposite idea, of course, is if the foot point motions are rapid compared to the time it takes uh, information to propagate along the field, you have alphane waves that propagate along the magnetic field. And these waves, uh, in order to heat the corona, have to become dissipated as they propagate along. Um, and the dissipation mechanism is another uh, big unknown in the system as well. So these are the so-called alternating current AC models. Uh, unfortunately, life isn't as simple as you know, pick, pick A or B. Uh, because when you actually look at the convective time scales of the sun, uh, it exhibits a continuum of time scales that actually bridge uh, the, the AC and DC limits. So there, are, so th there might be some regions of the sun where you can you know, make one of these inequalities uh, true, but in just about all the regions of the sun, uh, the time scales are roughly of, of the same order of magnitude as one another, and there are continuous distributions uh, where, where pr pretty much all the different, all these different options seem to be happening in, dif in different regions, and even when you do have waves in the in the in the solar corona, they're not just simple linear oscillations and linear sinusoidal oscillations. Their amplitudes can be large. There can be mixing between different wave modes. Um, any kind of nonlinearity you can think of is there. Uh, sometimes the the sinusoid these so-called sinusoidal oscillations only last for one or two periods before they die away. So you know, thinking of them as you know, e to the i omega t, which strictly goes on forever, isn't a, isn't a valid way of thinking about it either. And when you see this kind of braiding, this kind of twisting up and, 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 and uh, topological complexities evolving in the corona, that's not happening in a static way, as these DC models would, would say. It's highly dynamic. There's some very recent uh, measurements from the, so from the high C sounding rocket that flew in 2012 uh, shows uh, braiding on the, on the smallest scales in the UV corona, evolving with time scales of seconds to minutes. So there's all sorts of highly dynamic things happening. Um, but one of the useful ways that we found to think about all these different things is turbulence. Um, I don't, I'm probably a hyperbole to call it a, a unifying pr picture because it doesn't explain everything, but it seems to explain a lot of things. So the, the general idea is that convection shakes and braids the field lines. It, 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 it complexifies the field. This is a, a snapshot from a, from a 3D simulation, a reduced MHD simulation that Ad van Balahoyne did that illustrates the idea. Um, the process of braiding the field lines creates waves that propagate up into the corona. Um, part of those waves get reflected back down. And I'll, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute about turbulence, when you have counter-propagating uh, 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 magnetic perturbations along a magnetic field line, uh, you can ha it's, it's, it's almost like counter-propagating wave packets that can collide with one another. And when those wave packets collide, that uh, uh, starts up a nonlinear cascade of energy from large scales to small scales. It's the typical turbulent cascade. This is a snapshot from a, from a turbulent simulation that's happening in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. These swirls happen due to the counter, due to these collisions of wave packets coming up the field and down the field. So all these things seem to be happening at once. It's a complex picture. But turbulence provides a useful language for, for understanding how it works. OK, so here's my next comes my three slide. I tried not to make it any longer than that. Mini micro tutorial on turbulence. OK, so turbulence is a nonlinear process. Where um, 
it, it's characterized by energy uh, being becoming transferred from large scales to small scales. You know, you, if you have a cup of coffee, you're stirring the cup on the scale of the cup, but you see swirls start to spontaneously appear on smaller and smaller scales. Here's a snapshot of a, of a cartoon showing how those small scales naturally appear. Um, if you take the, the, the spatial Fourier transform of the, of the physical picture, you get uh, power versus either frequency or wave number. You can think of wave number, you know, it's the, the inverse of the wavelength of the size of the, of the fluctuations. So uh, a turbulence would, would start off with power only at the large physical scales or small wave numbers. You know, it would start off with sort of a delta function on the left-hand side of this uh, plot. But as the turbulence develops and, it, and it's driven, um, power at the smaller and smaller scales, larger and larger wave numbers, starts to appear. And in simulations, laboratory experiments, and a whole range of different models, that power ends up exhibiting a, a, a power law behavior. So, the, so, the, so, the, uh, so, so there's an exponential behavior with, with wave number. And what, what that's, been, that, that's been come to, under, uh, to be understood as sort of a pipeline for transporting energy from the large scales to the small scales. And back in 1938, von Karman and Howarth did sort of a dimensional analysis idea uh, to try to figure out how much energy flux was actually being transported from the large scales to the small scales. They made the assumption that the energy flux was constant. And, and this is for, the, for, the, for, for driven turbulence, you know, where you're constantly stirring on the large scales and the, the small scales are, are spontaneously being generated all the time. Um, they realized that if you, the, the input parameters of the problem, the, the density, the velocity of a given eddy, and the spatial size of an eddy, could only be combined in one unique way to produce an energy flux. And it turns out, once you, you do that within an order of magnitude or so, uh, that turns out to be the, the constant energy flux in, in a turbulent cascade. And the reason we care about that is because eventually the cascade reaches small enough scales that new physics starts to take over. We call it the dissipation range because on small enough scales in a, in a, in a hydrodynamic uh, gas or fluid, uh, things like viscosity or turbulent uh, or, or uh, uh, thermal conductivity uh, can take over and damp out the, or uh, essentially frictionally remove the energy, the, the kinetic energy in these, in these eddies and turn it into heat. In a magnetized plasma, there's a whole host of other dissipation mechanisms that can kick in as well. Um, but the nice thing about this assumption of a constant energy flux is, um, once you determine what that energy flux is at the big scale, at the large scale, from the, from the driving, that much energy that goes in has to come out of the, of, of the dissipation. So the, the eventual heating rate that you get out of this stirred up system is given by the energy flux that, that, you, that you put in at the beginning. And it seems like you're, 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 you're going on a, le a, a, you know, a, a leap and a prayer there to, to, to assume that this energy flux remains constant. But it, it's, it's been borne out in, in many generations of different kinds of simulations and laboratory experiments. Now, when you put in a magnetic field, things get more complex because you're restricting the, uh, the, 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 the dimensionality of the problem. You know, these eddies can't just form in any old direction they want because they're guided by the magnetic field. So with a strong background field, which has a tension associated with it, it's a lot easier to sort of mix up the field lines in the perpendicular direction than it is to, to produce small scale bends along the field. So here's a simulation where on the left hand side, it's, it was driven by, by, by stirring motions on the size of these little uh, uh, blue and red circles. Then the field extends off from left to right. And then when the turbulence becomes fully developed, you can see in the planes perpendicular to the field, that small scales have developed, the, the, the turbulent cascade has happened, but in the direction uh, uh, along, along the field, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot less of a cascade from large scales to small scales. And that's due to this magnetic tension effect. And also because of, because of the, the existence of this background field, the, the transport of these eddies along the field isn't isotropic in spatial direction anymore either. It's, it has to do with these counter-propagating packets, as I mentioned before. So the turbulent eddies in MHD turbulence are formed and also shredded into their smaller scales by collisions of alphane waves going in both directions along the field. And we can take this old dimensional analysis from, from von Karman and Howarth and Kolmogorov and, and generalize it to MHD turbulence. 
and uh, several generations of, of, of investigators have done that, and get out a, an effective heating rate due to the properties of the turbulence. As density stays the same, there's, a, there's another order unity correction factor that you have to play around with a bit. This, velocity, this eddy velocity cubed now has to be broken up a, a little bit to, to take into account the existence of the eddies going in both directions. So by, by balancing it this way, we see that if, if there's only uh, 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 alpha N waves propagating in one direction along the field, call it V plus, and there's no power coming back in V minus, then there's no turbulence. You've got to have both uh, V plus and V minus in order for this to work. And also this L, this uh, uh, length scale of the eddy, now has to be constrained to the perpendicular direction because that's the, that's the dimension where the, where the turbulence, where the cascade is actually taking place. OK. So, so this actually ends up being a very useful phenomenological heating rate that we can insert into models of coronal heating if, if we know the values for all the parameters. Now we also realize once we look a little bit in more detail at, at these rho v cubed over L type, type uh, 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 expressions, that turbulent heating is magnetic heating. You know, there's, there's, there's a whole generation of, of uh, solar MHD, 3D MHD codes that are, that are producing coronal heating by assuming the coronal heating rate is proportional to the magnetic field strength of the, of, of the corona. And we're finding that that's actually that, that was, was, was sort of empirically judged by looking at, the, at, the, at, at images of the sun. You know, active regions that have strong 100 Gauss fields have, have hotter temperatures and are much brighter in the corona. Uh, but we find that this magnetic heating actually makes sense from the standpoint of the turbulence. I won't go through all the details, but it turns out that if you look at the magnetic field in the corona, you can map that uh, back to the solar photosphere. Uh, you know, the, pretty much all the, all the magnetic field in the corona maps down to very small little features in the solar photosphere that have roughly a kilogauss field strength. But they have a very sl a small filling factor, which means that as they expand out, the field weakens and they fill the volume uh, uh, by expanding by orders of you know, 10 to 100 to almost 1,000. Um, but if you, if you express the, the, the coronal field like that, and you also uh, input some other assumptions about the magnetic flux tubes, especially from the, something called thin flux tube theory that Hank Sprout uh, dealt with in the early 80s, you can write this uh, turbulent heating rate as a function of the parameters in the photosphere and this, this, this filling factor of the magnetic field. And when you put all these different factors together, it's linearly proportional to the filling factor, which means that the coronal heating rate in units of the uh, heating rate down at the photosphere is given by the magnetic field strength in the corona in units of the field strength at the photosphere. It's rough, it's approximate, but it does explain a lot of the observations that find that coronal heating is correlated with the magnetic field in the corona. OK, that was, that was the turbulence tutorial. And now uh, I can just give several uh, different examples of how we've applied that to models of the, of the solar wind. OK. so. We want to build up a model of, of, of how the coronal heating drives the solar wind. Uh, we still don't know for sure if, if Parker's idea of gas pressure acceleration is, is sufficient for driving the whole solar wind. And we also don't know the, the answer to some of these other conundrums that I mentioned before. You know, are, the, are the open flux tubes always open? You, know, you, you see them when we look at uh, off-limb images and process them uh, uh, sufficiently nicely. Um, but so if, is that the case? Do the waves just propagate up the open field and then dissipate? Or is the fact that the open fields are always sitting in sort of a bath of, of closed magnetic loops that are also being jostled around by the convection, is there, so is there, is there an injection of mass and energy from the closed fields into the open fields? It's another big controversy. Uh, there's been some, some ideas. I wrote a paper with Odd van Balahoyne a few years ago where we, we looked at the energy balance of this reconnection loop opening idea. We concluded it doesn't work, that there's not enough energy to power the corona. Uh, other people have different conclusions. Aaron Roberts wrote a paper that same year that said that neither of these ideas has sufficient energy to power the corona. So it's still, there's still a lot of uh, back and forth in the community about what's driving what. Um, but we decided to go with this idea of looking at the waves and turbulence uh, for, for the simple reason that 
uh, you know, no matter the relative importance of these other types of events, we do know that the waves and turbulent motions are really present everywhere that you look, from the photosphere up to the heliosphere. This is a plot of measurements of the, essentially, of alphane wave amplitudes measured as a velocity, transverse velocity amplitude of, of a magnetic field line as a function of height above the solar photosphere. So this is a very sort of compressed uh, axis here, logarithmic scale. So you've got the photosphere down here, where the little bright points in between the convective cells are being random, you know, jostled and random walking across the surface with velocities of order one to two kilometers per second. Uh, up in the solar chromosphere, Hinode has, has looked at the velocities of spicules that are swaying back and forth. And if you take into account all the line of sight effects, you get velocities of order 20 kilometers per second. Uh, Off-limb UV uh, measurements have looked at spectral line broadening that can be uh, analyzed to give you uh, uh, amplitudes of, of the waves as well. And then there's the measurements out by spacecraft that, it, that go into about 60 uh, uh, solar radii, that's 0.3 AU, orbit of Mercury or so, and then all the way out. And in order to make all these measurements agree with one another, you really need some sort of damping for the waves. And the damping is consistent with heating, as, as, as I talked about before. If, if the alphane waves were just propagating out passively and not damping, if they were just purely linear waves propagating out, this is a log-log scale, so, they're, so they could follow any one of these dotted curves, and you can basically translate those dotted curves up and down wherever you want, but there is no one dotted curve that, that takes all the data into account. You need to start off on this high one and then end up closer to the low one there. And that means that this wave energy gets damped out. Uh, and the damping, and the damping that, that the amount of energy that you sap away from the waves by, by doing that happens to be of the right order of magnitude to heat the corona. So it all does seem to hold together. In, uh, in 2007, we applied these, these wave models, these turbulent, uh, turbulent cascade models, to uh, one-dimensional, one-fluid models of, of the solar wind that went all the way from the photosphere out to the heliosphere, like I showed. And we self-consistently solved for the properties of the waves, the damping, the heating, and the background uh, uh, density, velocity, and temperature along those flux tubes. And there's been other, other groups who've been doing that as well. Um, but the nice thing about going all the way down to the photosphere was that the only free parameters were the waves at the photospheric lower boundary and the shape of the, of the radial magnetic field. So we didn't have to in, insert any artificial coronal heating in, in, the, in the process. Uh, the coronal heating occurs naturally, it produces temperatures, peak temperatures of order one to two million degrees, as we see in the, in the corona. And the amount of solar wind acceleration that we get has both wave pressure and gas pressure. The, the, the wave pressure is something I can talk about if anybody's curious. Alphane waves can actually provide a net uh, outward ponderomotive force to the gas that, that accelerates the wind, especially in the low density regions. Uh, the, the plot over here shows a series of models that were computed for different uh, magnetic flux tubes at solar minimum. Here's that stretched dipole that we sort of saw in the, in the, in the uh, eclipse image at the very beginning. And the, the, the red curves are over the poles, the blue curves are over the equator, uh, and, and the models show the wind speed out at uh, the orbit of Ulysses. Which, which went out past, which I mentioned, went out of the ecliptic plane and scanned from North Pole to South Pole. The black curves show the, show the velocity measurements of Ulysses and the density, and the, and the models tend to do the right kind of thing, including this, this bistable jump between the high-speed wind and the low-speed wind. The, uh, the, the rainbow curve and the brown curve show slightly different parameters in the models, but, 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 they, but they mainly do the right, the right kind of thing. And this bi-stability happens because of some strange vagaries with the Parker critical point and where that is and where the heating is, whether the heating is being deposited below the critical point or above the critical point. And again, I can talk about that if anybody's curious. Uh, but since then, this was a time-steady, one-fluid model that treated the turbulence with that, with that simple phenomenological heating rate, the rho v cubed over L type thing. Uh, we've been trying to test that by doing uh, more more models, more time-dependent models of turbulence. Ad van Balahoyen and Ma Asgari have been doing some more simulations of MHD turbulence in a similar kind of expanding flux tube. They follow the 3D fluctuations, so they're actually following the development of the wave packets that are propagating up and reflecting and colliding and producing this swirly effect in the planes perpendicular to the field. 
Um, it's a simplified model in that there's no parallel flows or density fluctuations, so it's completely incompressible. The fluctuations are confined to the interior of this fl fixed flux tube, and that's sort of orthogonal to some of the observations where we see the flux tubes random walking around the surface of the sun. Um, but it seems to do the right thing, and the, the heating rates that we get out largely validate these phenomenological rates that went into the simpler codes. Um, but interestingly, because it's a time-dependent model, we see time-dependent fluctuations. This is a plot of the heating rate at a given uh, location in the, in the low corona, and it's varying over orders of magnitude in a, in a very bursty kind of way. Um, previously, the, uh, this sort of so-called nanoflare-like intermittent heating has only been thought of as an outcome of the DC-type coronal models, where, where the quasi-static states are, are rapidly uh, disturbed by magnetic reconnections. But, but a wave-like model, an AC-type model, can actually generate it too. Now there's another group, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, a Japanese group, uh, Takeru Suzuki and his students and postdocs have been doing two-dimensional models that are driving the system in a very similar way. They have an expanding flux tube, they shake the bottom uh, of the flux tube and drive alphane waves up. Um, it's only two-dimensional, so they don't have both uh, the sort of the, the, the X and the Y direction in the, in the horizontal direction. So they don't have the turbulent cascade, they don't have the MHD effects that, that, that exist in these other models. But even without that traditional cascade, they still get coronal heating, they still get wind acceleration, which has been kind of a, a surprising thing, uh, and they also get parallel flows, density enhancements that look kind of like uh, spicules, and, and all sorts of interesting dynamics that look a lot like what's, what's happening in some regions of the corona as well. But it was surprising to see that they could actually get all this stuff without that traditional MHD cascade. So it seems like the, the, the corona has more than one way to, to produce a lot of what we see. I can, uh, if I have a little bit of time, I can just say a few words about the other stars. Uh, you know, this 2007 paper I mentioned for the sun, where we solved the full set of mass momentum and energy conservation equations. It's a lot of work for the sun. Uh, what uh, Steve Saar and I did a few years ago was we solved a simplified version of just the energy conservation equation in order to solve for just one parameter that we measure for these other stars. That's the mass loss rate. And we can, but, but essentially, we used the same NHD turbulent heating rate that we used in the solar model. And we took advantage of simulations of turbulent convection that Musilak and Almschneider did. You know, they, they showed the, 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 the flux in alphane waves at the photosphere due to turbulent convection as a function of the stellar parameters, you know, as a function of the effective temperature and the surface gravity of the star. The, the, the three colored curves show their results, and we sort of parameterized it and extended it out so that we could do it for a wider range of stellar types. Uh, there's all sorts of details about this energy equation. You know, different regions of the, uh, of, the, of the solar atmosphere, different terms in the energy conservation equation are important. For example, in the photosphere, all it cares about is radiation. This, this Q rad is the, is, the rate, is the net radiative heating rate. It's, compi it's comprised of a radiative heating and radiative cooling rates that are summed together. Um, and, and the balance between those in the photosphere determines the photospheric properties. When you get up into the chromosphere, the radiation starts to compete with other terms, like the deposition of heat from waves or turbulence or whatever you're putting in. You're going up higher into the transition region in the corona. You get things like uh, heat conduction, you know, where the, where the conduction flux is proportional to the temperature gradient. Uh, you get enthalpy fluxes and gravity starting to be important too. So it's, it's a much more complicated region. And once you go way out in, in the wind, the only important component to the energy is the kinetic energy flux of the wind itself. All these other terms are, are negligible. So what, what Egil Lear and uh, Viggo Hanstein showed in the, in a few decades ago was that you can actually simplify the energy balance by looking at one of these heights and comparing it to another, say the transition region with the very far corona, and look at just a subset of these terms and essentially solve for the mass flux. If you know how much heat is being dumped in and how much is conducting down from the, uh, from the corona to the chromosphere. Uh, so we did that for a whole bunch of different stars. Uh, the challenge, there, was, there were challenges on actually trying to determine accurate values from the measurements for a lot of these, uh, for a lot of these different uh, uh, parameters. For example, the, 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 the magnetic flux tube area expansion has to do with the filling factor of magnetic field on the stellar surface, and there's only a small number of stars where we have uh, uh, indirect measurements of that. 
But let me just skip to the end. The, uh, the, 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 the com computations of mass loss rate from this MHD turbulent uh, model are shown on the right. This, this plot on the left is essentially what I showed. There's a, there's a white background instead of a black one, so maybe it's easier to see the, the changes in color. The, the box just shows the same region of parameter space for context of these solar type main sequence and giant stars. And, and the colors over here were computed from the models. These are the observations. And the fact that the colors seem to match up pretty well um, is, is, a, is, is a good result. The, uh, the, this model that we published actually has a much better chi-squared agreement between the observations and the models than just about any, any of the other uh, empirical mass loss prescriptions that are being used right now in, in stellar evolution codes and things like that. So we, we, we distributed an IDL code with the, with the paper, with the uh, supplementary material online, so people can start to apply that if they like. Um, I'll, I'll skip by this. You know, we, we've also applied this MHD turbulence to compute the X-ray fluxes from young stars, where there's MHD turbulence. There's also accretion that can provide extra turbulence, uh, even in stars with, 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 that are still young and have, de have debris disks, you know, large Kuiper belts that have been imaged with radio uh, uh, and submillimeter observations. We still see coronal emission, and these models have, have been pretty successfully used to predict the X-rays and uh, radio and submillimeter emission from some of these stars, too. That's, that's about it. Um, what do I have to say? You know, we've still got all these solar problems. We've still got the coronal heating problem. We've still got solar wind acceleration problem. Um, they're, they're not conclusively solved. Uh, but we're including more and more real physics, like MHD turbulence, in these models. And they're, uh, they're gradually doing better and better at explaining all the observations that we're seeing. Um, we still don't have good enough observational constraints to help us choose between the competing theories. So we need to do a better job of, of talking back, to, uh, back and forth between the uh, ob observing and, and, and modeling communities to figure out what, the, what those key observables really should be. Um, for the other stars, you know, the theories are doing better, um, but only when we have sufficient information about the star. You know, not just the basic things like their luminosity and their mass, but also more subtle things that are harder to measure, like their rotation rate, their magnetic field, the filling factors of the magnetic field on the surface. Um, and overall, it's been very fruitful by, by going back and forth between these different communities, solar physics, space physics, plasma physics, astrophysics. There's a lot of uh, good interdisciplinary stuff there. OK, thanks. Maybe if, if we could get a better handle on the, 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 the energy budget of the different types of waves that are present, the different types of fluctuations. You know, is it all alphane waves, you know, transverse incompressible things? You know, there's, there's tantalizing hints of, of, of compressible you know, longitudinal density variations along the field, too. But uh, I don't know if the, if the you, know, uh, you know, I have this plot of the, of the of the amplitudes versus height and, ver and also versus the uh, predictions. I, I, it would be nice if those other, t other sources of wave energy could also be characterized to the point of being able to compare them with, with something like this. Then once we know how they're all sort of working together, maybe coupling with one another, that would, that would, that would start to, to, to help the models sort of settle out, I think. Or it might complexify the models even more. I don't know. It's, it's roughly 50-50. I mean, you, you, could, you could probably do a radially dependent measure of the two pressure components. But, but in the first couple of solar radii, it's, it's pretty close to comparable that the, uh, that the wave pressure does its own thing and the, and the gas pressure from the, from the heating does, give, give, does a roughly similar thing. In the slow solar wind, it's, most, it's mostly the gas pressure. The alphane speed? Hmm. We should look. Uh, my student just created a big grid of 600 different types of models of, of all sorts of different possible magnetic fields. And we can, we can easily mine that and, and take a look. 
the uh, we, 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 we have. Oh, oh. Um, well, typically in the fast solar wind, the, the outplane speed can be 1,500, 2,000 kilometers per second. Um, but if is there a correlation? Does, does, does a reduction in the outplane speed in the corona mean a reduction in the wind speed? Um, probably it does. I don't know if it's correlation or causation. There's, 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 there's a whole bunch of different ideas. The, the, the basic idea that we relied on, and it, it doesn't seem to be able, it doesn't seem like it would produce a lot of reflection, but it, it actually produces enough, is just the linear reflection due to the fact that you're propagating up into regions of different alphane speed. You know, you, you can see it the most at the transition region, right? There's a, there's a rapid step-like jump in the alphane speed. So, so you can see that you'll see reflection and transmission, and it'll be very inefficient. Right, but, but even when those boundary layers get, get fuzzed out and get, become gradual changes in the alphane speed, you can still see partial reflection. Um, because what you're comparing against, you know, with the, with, the, with the transition region, it's a very sharp thing. So basically, any alphane wave is going to reflect. But if you have a gradual transition, you want to look at the width of that transition and compare it to the wavelength of the alphane wave. If the wavelength is long compared to it, it's almost like it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wall. It's, it's, a, it's a sharp jump. So it has a lot, of, uh, a lot of reflection. So the lower the frequency of the alphane waves, the better they are at reflecting, because that's the longer wavelengths. It seems to work in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, in the, in the flux tubes like in the little inset there, in, in those types of flux tubes, it, it, seems to, it seems to work over the right range of heights. That's, yeah, we think that's the basic, uh, the basic scale. The, 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 the granulation, the, 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 the basic convection cells are about 1,000 kilometers. Um, you know, the sun is 700,000 kilometers radius, right? So, so uh, 1,000 kilometers, but in between the cells, there are these, um, there are the, where is that movie? In between the cells, where the, where the, where the rising motions are the bright motions, and then they collide, and the dark lanes uh, are, where the, uh, are where the motions go back down, that's where the magnetic field tends to collect. So there are little bright, so, so one of those uh, things is about 1,000 kilometers, but the size of the little magnetic bright points, which, which you can't see in that image, I should have another one somewhere, uh, those, are, those have radii of only about 50 to 100 kilometers. Uh, and those get, get jostled around and stay in the, in the dark lanes. And, and, and that's where the kilogauss magnetic fields in the photosphere tend to collect. And that's where everything, that's where all those space-filling magnetic field lines in the corona uh, ultimately tend to, to, to wind up. And in the argument, relate Q to B, does that require uh, cascading or turbulence to establish that relationship? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I made use of that, of that scaling, of that dimensional, uh, right. of that rho V cubed over L, which, which has that assumption that there's a constant uh, flux of energy from the, from the big scales to the small scales. That's right. That's right. Well, no, the, 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 the changing F values are basically uh, coming down to changing filling factors of, you know, it, when the, for the largest filling factors, that's a coronal field of like 100 gauss or so, like an active region, a bright, uh, a strong active region. But, but when it's lower, it can just be a quiet sun region too. But it seems to, 
we do the right thing. Now there's some, there, there's been other, other, you know, Q proportional to B to some power. You know, Pepsov might have had 1.1, but I've seen 1.5 and others that might, there might be some other nonlinearities in there too. You mean the super granules, say? It seems to me that they might take the photosphere and stir it to walk the sphere and make it out. Like granularly get the same thing out of it. Well, it depends on, on its neighbors. It depends on how many, in a larger region, it depends on how many of those uh, flux tubes there are because once it expands up into the corona, it's crowded out by those other ones. If it's Imbalance has, has a, has definitely has a big thing, to, a big uh, factor to do with it too, right? Yeah. Of, of magnetic flux, you know, uh, of, you know, coronal holes are, are you know, the, the imbalance ratio of, you know, B plus to B minus, B plus minus B minus over the, over the sum is something like, you know, 50 to 80 percent, and in the quiet sun it's close to zero. Um, and, and models of the... I, no, no, but the but the magnetic carpet is is is. <laughs> I, I I think that's happening on a, on a fundamentally bit larger scale than 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 the, than the convection. Um, that's just due to the the fact that there there are emerging and and interacting uh, magnetic flux concentrations. Um, I, I I should point you to my 2010 paper. Where, where I did this Monte Carlo simulation of the, of the magnetic carpet in different regions of imbalance. Um, uh, but it, 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 it's essentially on scales separated from the, from the turbulent scales. The same energy flux going in to an open field region and a closed field region. The the, the, the energy balance is going to be different because the you know in, in, the, in the right right. So the so the so the, so, the, so the base pressure that, that settles at the base of the transition region it can be orders of magnitude higher in the in the closed field regions uh, than it is in. Maybe I mean the, the base of the corona, the you know, 500,000 degree type coronal base, you know, the, the, the neon seven <laughs> corona. We, 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 we made our assumptions and wanted to follow them and see what they would, what they would say. But, uh, no, because the, the, you know, this, 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 this basic idea of, of balancing the, the transition region uh, energetics to the, to the far solar, you know, far supersonic solar wind energetics, it sort of bypasses the, the, the corona altogether. 
in a way, the coronal heating is just sort of an intermediate storage area for the energy, you know. Uh, In, in, in some of these stars, there is no corona at all. In the they we 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 compute mass loss rates from from this, and I've, I've got backup slides if anybody's curious about the uh, about the, the the wave pressure as well. In some of the giant stars, the, the low gravity stars, the, the the wave pressure dominates, and. Uh, the, And, 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 there, and there's a clear thermal boundary. The, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the radiative cooling rate gives a clear thermal boundary between stars that should have a corona and shouldn't have a corona. Um, but it's the, same, it's the same idea for the energy deposition from the turbulence. Yeah. 